Don Freer. It's on the badge here. And I was with the 91st Bomb Group. I started out as a co-pilot, but because of so many losses, I soon became a first pilot. And I flew 26 missions before I was shot down. And I shot down over Berlin and became a POW for about six months. Tech Sergeant Burton Madison, ball turret gunner on a B-24 in the 453rd Bomb Group, 8th Air Force. Jimmy Stewart was my group operations officer. He briefed us on the missions. And I was lucky enough to fly one mission with him. He came along as a co-pilot on one of my missions. My plane was partial payment. But we, tra we trained in Walla Walla, Washington, Rapid City, South Dakota, <laughs> Pocatello, Idaho, mm -hmm. Payote, Texas, and then we went overseas. We flew over the North Atlantic route from um, Dander, Newfoundland okay. to Prestwick, Scotland. Oh, boy. Uh-huh. <clears throat> I didn't break out of my shell until 1976. Mm -hmm. My family didn't even know I was in the war. And um, after I went to one of these reunions, I opened up a little bit. And That's the way it was with my dad. Yeah, All yeah. I knew is he'd been on an airplane. Yeah. May the 8th of 44, Harry Truman's birthday. So we put up 48 planes, maximum effort for him on his behalf that day. Went to Brunswick, Germany, aircraft factory. We lost 15 10-man crew that day. That's 150 of my buddies went down on that one mission. I got my ball turret shot off and under me, but I survived it, thank goodness. Uh, my eighth mission, I thought, how in the heck am I going to do 30 at this rate? We lose 150 of my buddies on one mission. Any memorabilia you may have that you wish to live in a museum, let me know. Uh, I've been visiting museums around, um, I live in Arkansas, so I've been going to the southern states and looking at uh, places, especially new museums, small military museums who don't get many artifacts. They are really uh, supportive of what we're doing and trying to um, save these um, uh, precious items. So far through September 30th, we are showing a very small loss, about $3,000. Most of that is due to a paper loss on our investments. As you know, the stock market from about the end of June through the end of September, took a horrible tumble, and we were not immune to that. Uh, so that is the primary reason for our loss. Our membership dues are slightly above what we had projected, which is great news, and any new members we can get just helps that along. We have received some uh, bequests from a few members who have passed on and have thought that the society was a good resting place for, for some money. So that has greatly helped us out. And with that, we're hoping that we will be able to, uh, to finish the year in the black. So, so far it's been, other than the, uh, the stock market decline, it's been a good year for us. Our total membership right now is a little over 4,000. And I thought, just before I, I left to come here, I, I got a stack, some magazines back in the mail. Normally that means that they could not deliver because that person is no longer there because they're deceased. So I've got to do some adjustments. We do that every time we mail out the magazine. We get a lot of notifications. Anytime you move, um, we don't have as many snowbirds as we used to, but if you move, Please don't forget to drop me a line or have a relative drop me a line or something giving me a new address because I don't divine this stuff. I'm pretty talented, but I just, you know, I lost my <coughs> divine connection to know where somebody is at all times. So please let us know. It does save us a lot of postage, all right? Okay, I have a very pleasant announcement to make. Our secretary, Mr. Garber, is uh, finishing his term on the board. And we, because of the good work that he has done to educate school children about the 8th Air Force, we are creating a position that we probably needed for a while and just haven't had the right person to fill it. So he is going to be our Chief of Veterans Affairs and Education.
he has done I wish a lot of school fortunately he has schools that are receptive to having him come in and do that there are a lot of schools that won't uh, but he's done a great job he creates a good rapport with the kids he knows how to talk to the administration and the teachers uh, so if any of you are involved in education or want to be involved in education in the local schools and you feel you need some advice on how to proceed or the type of program to present, Mr. Garber is your man. Uh, also, uh, if any of you have any concerns about the society that you want to raise, uh, you can also go to Joe and he will forward them on to the board. So congratulations, Joe. Okay, just very quickly as an overview, we have set the reunion dates for this time next year. The reunion location is St. Louis, Missouri. How many of you in the room went to the last reunion that was in St. Louis? Wonderful. Well, you'll be pleased to know that we are using that same hotel. They have updated it a bit. It is, and I had to write this down because it's a mouthful, it is the Sheridan Westport Lakeside Chalet. Of course, all the information will be in the magazine. Uh, we're all set. The rate's 109, so it's, you know, it's what you're used to paying. We're also working with the same sales director who is very familiar with the group, so very in tune with our needs physically and otherwise. All of the hospitality rooms, memorabilia room, are going to be on the ground level all around a central hub. So that way, we can visit and meet in the middle and visit and meet in the middle and have a really good time. All right? Now, for those of you, oh, yes. October the 20th through the 24th. What we needed to do in order to take advantage of lower rates, and we're very, very conscious of money, okay, was to, to just shift our days instead of Wednesday through Saturday as far as start the, the welcome reception to the final gala. We had to shift one day to the right so it is Thursday through Sunday. So we'll have a Sunday night gala. But other than that, you know, the basic format will remain the same. But our goal is to not schedule two events at the same time that people want to go to both events and have to make that choice. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for having us and thank you Dave for letting us take up some of your time at your membership meeting. We are members, we receive the magazine, we read the magazine um, and uh, we're honoured to be here and take part in this reunion. I think it's the fourth year in a row that someone from the American Air Museum has uh, attended. Um, so, last year I came with Jenny Cousins, uh, who's the project leader, and we talked about the new website uh, that launched that week. It was like a new baby and now I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna talk about the year it's had and then my colleague Emily is gonna talk about what we hope uh, we'll be doing with it in the future and how we can use the website to improve the displays in the American Air Museum itself for visitors there um, so just to mainly the main point I have to say is thank you very much to everyone who's used the American Air Museum website to date um, it's, we've been very, very impressed with uh, the way that you guys have taken to it and you've really gone on there and about 3,000 people have registered and made edits to the site, which is really incredible. When you think that before we were a project team, we had to be emailed, uh, we had to basically correspond individually with that number of people, it would have been an incredible kind of effort within a, one building. And what the website has enabled us to do, we think, is for you in your own homes to go in there, to enter the name, your own name, your relative's name, find it, edit the entry. And you've been adding so much great information. I mean, it's really, we're in the office, we're doing something else entirely, and then we find that a relative has uploaded a photograph, added more information, really taken part. And it's so heartening, um, the, the way that you guys have taken to it. Um, so we just want to say thank you very much for everything you've done so far. Um, we, as a museum, as you all know, I think, um, have uh, 
part of Roger Freeman's collection, um, which includes 15,000 photographs. And as we said last year, we're very aware that he only gained those prints because of the trust placed in him uh, by so many hundreds of veterans, thousands probably, um, who he t spoke to and corresponded with over decades of research. And that's why part of the reason why the website exists, because we knew, we knew that even though those prints had physically entered the museum and that we would take care of them and digitize them, they belong to all of you and all of you who corresponded with Roger. So 10,000 of those are currently on the website and the final 5,000 we hope to, will, well, they will go up in January, this coming January 2016. Um, and at that point, we, we promise we'll have shared all of Roger's photographs that came to us with all of you. So I hope that when those go live in January, you, if you haven't been to the site in a while, you come back to it, have a look and see if we've got any photos that maybe you're not aware of and do help us um, by adding more information about them. Uh, but it's just, it's just been really incredible. And thank you so much for helping a museum that is so far away um, with its work. And obviously, we, we've been looking this way. You guys have been saying, oh, you know, you've, had, you've come so far. It's like, we look this way all the time, you know. <laughs> In our project office, we're, all, we're, we're emailing guys, we're calling you up, and we have to get the special block on our phone taken off because we're not, other people in the museum can't call the US. We're like, we need this block taken off. You don't, we've got to call Deborah, you know. Um, so it's a really, I just want you to know that our little hut uh, in Duxford Airfield is, is thinking about you guys all the time and uh, working hard for you, we hope. Um, so thank you, that's all I'm going to say. And Emily's just going to talk about um, our, uh, what we're up to at the moment and how you guys can help us out and then I'll, I'll answer questions that you have. So, Emily. So Lucy spent a long time thanking you for all your hard work and I'm here to tell you it continues. We still need your help. Um, in the exhibition, which will reopen uh, March 2016, we will be redoing our role of honour. For anyone who visited previously, it was tablets on the wall. Um, now it's going to be, it's going to draw from the website. We want a wall of names with their faces alongside it. Uh, but in order to do that, we need you. We need you and your photos to upload them onto the website. If you know anybody who was killed in action or died during the Second World War, a member of the 8th Air Force, go online, upload them, and then you'll come into the gallery and you'll see this list of names with their faces alongside. And yeah, that's, that's our call to arms. <laughs> For an organization that doesn't have any bricks and mortar, um, we're about feelings, we're about a, a virtual mission that everybody in this room understands. And uh, we're trying to preserve history, we're trying to preserve uh, you know, the important values. And uh, it's great among people who get it. It's hard to point to the things we've done, but people who get it uh, recognize the Heritage League over the years for, among other things, who we recognize, who we call out. Um, we're about to present an award that um, we invented a few years ago because we were pleased at the behavior of some of the veteran generation in situations where some people were getting very petty and political and forgetting what the big mission was. And up the executive committee of the Heritage League of the Second Air Division does proudly induct Elmo Maiden. Into the Heritage League Hall of Fame, class of 2015. The Hall of Fame was established to recognize valuable and un unstinting service by individuals over many years to veteran organizations of the USAAF 8th Air Force of World War II. Inductees have practiced the honoring and remembering, which is the core activity of the League, and moreover, have inspired and encouraged others to serve effectively with dignity and grace. For many years now, Elmo, you have been a participant, leader, and supporter in veteran groups, welcoming others as long-serving treasurer and secretary in your own 466th BGA, helping with programming and even funding 
of the long-running Southern California 2nd Air Division luncheon, and regularly participating in the venerable, if less formal, Wings Over Wendy's <laughs> monthly meetings of flying veterans in Southern California. Your gentlemanly comportment has been a fine example to people in your own and following generations and reminds us, sometimes we need it, that effective volunteers, effective volunteer work can also be fun. We join so many of your colleagues in the organizations in thanking you for your steadfast honoring and remembering signed by our entire board October 16, 2015. Elmo. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and a Master of Arts degree in Geography, both from UCLA. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Bill Beigel. How does this sound? Excellent. Excellent? Okay, great. Well, my name is Bill Beagle, and I'm uh, very excited to be here. Just in the 36 hours that I've been around here, I've had some amazing conversations with some of the veterans in this group. And uh, boy, the stories that these guys tell, like it's some sort of event, when in fact it's an aircraft crashing, which I, I can't imagine what could be more terrifying. So, my gosh, I... Uh, I just love to, to have these little moments to chat with folks. When my dad was a kid, growing up in the 1930s, his family broke up and he went with his mother to Detroit, Michigan. And being wartime, housing was difficult to find, so he went and lived with his cousins. And my dad only had a sister, he never had any, any uh, brothers. And the family that he lived with, his cousin, um, had a son named Morris, who was about six years older than my dad. So he was, uh, I guess, born in 1922. And when World War II began, my dad's cousin Morris was working at a machine shop in Flint, Michigan. And about eight weeks after Pearl Harbor was attacked, my dad's cousin Morris joined the military. And shortly thereafter, he volunteered for the Air Corps. And my dad was very, very excited about that. In fact, for my dad's whole life, uh, he would have been, my dad would have been 85 years old today. So that's kind of interesting. But anyway, uh, my dad's whole life, he would draw B-17s and B-24s. And he was always very interested in that. But I knew that he was not in World War II, he was in the Korean War, and, and I would ask him, you know, Dad, why are you so interested in B-17s or P-51 Mustangs? And he didn't really want to talk about it. I, I knew there was something there that, I don't know, he just didn't want to share it. But anyway, uh, not, mm, oh, maybe now it's about 15 years ago, I was talking to my dad, and he said, you know, when I was uh, living in Detroit, Michigan, my cousin Morris was in the Air Corps. And I said, you had a cousin Morris in the Air Corps? It was, it was something I had never heard anything about. And he said, all I know about my cousin is he went away to fly in World War II and he never returned. And um, my dad said, you know, you, you were a history major at UCLA and I always had a bit of interest in that sort of thing. So he said, you know, if you can find out anything about my cousin, I'd, I'd really like to know about it. So. The way that he asked me was so nice that I, I had to do it. So that's what I started to, uh, I decided to find out about Morris Myers, my dad's, my dad's cousin. So I started to dig in and, and I was a history major but I knew nothing about military records or any of that kind of stuff so I, I really was starting from scratch. Anyway, I found out that after my dad's cousin volunteered for the Air Corps, he was assigned to the 385th Bomb Group. 
and I've talked to some of those great B-17 folks in here already today. On June 20th, 1943, Morris Myers and his crew of 10 other guys, or, or nine other guys, left their base in Gander Bay, Newfoundland, to fly to England to join the 8th Air Force and begin their missions. Now, what I'm telling you right now is already more than my dad ever knew. My dad said I think he was missing in action over Germany, but none of us know, and so just... Uh, just that little bit was, was interesting. So, about 12 hours after the plane left Gander Bay, Newfoundland, they were going to Prestwick, Scotland, the plane was reported as overdue. 24 hours later, it was reported as missing. Now, there are a number of, uh, there's actually two reports filed for this plane. I, I know there's some historians here who know about missing air crew reports. So there is a missing air crew report for Morris Myers plane. There's also a big aircraft accident report. However, both of those reports, and the aircraft accident report is 30 pages, both of those reports say cause is unknown. We don't know what happened to that plane. The co-pilot of the plane had a father who was a very prominent attorney. And so when that co-pilot's father got that missing in action, or whatever information he got, it was very vague, and he said, I'm not going to accept that the Air Force doesn't know where my son's plane is. And this is, again, this is the co-pilot of my cousin, my dad's cousin's plane. So this attorney had some contacts in the Air Corps, and acting as if he didn't know what he was doing, he got a call in, I don't know how he did it, he got a call in to the base weather officer at Gander Bay, and he said, you know, he, he told him, he made up a whole story, and it's all in the file. He said, I am planning to visit Newfoundland next summer, and I want to know what the weather is like around the second or third week of June most years. And I'm, I'm just curious, what was the weather like in June of 1943, around June 20th? And so, and, and you really got to read this guy's letters, because they are very polished, they're very well done, but you know what he's trying to do. So anyway, the Air Force wrote back and said, the weather was pretty bad on June 20th, 1943. And in fact, we grounded a number of the B-17s that were leaving that day because the weather was so bad. Now, unfortunately, that was not the case with my, my dad's cousin's plane. Meanwhile, his family back in the United States had almost no information at all. By the way, I just redid this program for the 8th Air Force, so give me a, give me a, just a second here. All right, so what I have up on the screen, that is an unknown crew from the 385th Bomb Group. And I decided that, who knows, maybe that's, maybe that's the crew that my dad's cousin belonged to, because unfortunately there are no photos of him. Nobody has anything about him. Anyway, the plane was gone for about a year when Morris's sister got a letter from the Air Force. Now, often in World War II, folks or flyers would say, I don't want that scary, dreadful telegram to go to mom and dad. I want it to go to my brother or my sister so that they can be the one to go to mom and dad and say, hey, the plane is missing. Anyway, so Morris's sister got a very unusual letter. The letter stated in part... You'll see I have it highlighted up there. The letter said, there is enclosed a check for $3.35, which represents the only property of Sergeant Myers received at the Army Effects Bureau to date. These funds were received by mail from overseas. So hopefully that is puzzling to you because as I said, Morris never made it overseas. So his sister wrote back a very pointed letter to the Air Force, and it's the kind of letter that I think if it had been written today, it might have had a few more expletives in it, <laughs> but, but she, she was in 1944, so she kept it a bit more polite, but she said, how in, 
How could this possibly be happening? He's gone. He's disappeared. He never made it overseas. How are you guys finding a check for $3.35? Now, I would love to give you a good story about how that happened, but the Army did not respond. However, I have subsequently found that what the Army Air Corps would do is they would go through some of the lockers of guys that had been stateside, and if they found anything that was clearly belonging to someone, they'd send it home. However, what happened here, I wish I knew, but that letter from, um, from uh, his sister, Betty Myers, was, was really something. So that's a little bit of how I came to be doing this kind of work. And in so doing it, I finally got some of the documents to my dad, and he was thrilled. Only he and his older sister, I believe, are even alive today that know anything about Morris. And so my dad just read these documents over and over and over and over. And he said, you know, Bill, I bet there's a lot of people that, that would be interested in this kind of stuff. And I said, boy, I, I imagine there are a lot of people that are interested in this. Now, at the time, I was working a very boring, commonplace corporate job that I won't waste anybody's time talking about. But on the sidelines, I started doing more and more of this work. And I found that there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that were similarly curious, like my dad was. So that's how I got into doing this kind of work. And now I've done about 1,600 Americans killed in World War II, kind of evenly split between Air Corps, Army, and Marines. And I've done a number of Navy and Coast Guard men, too. So let's talk a little bit about the historical backdrop here. Um, World War II caused the deaths of 50 to as many as 85 million people worldwide. About 20 million of those were in the military. Of that group, 406,000 Americans gave their lives in the war. And these soldiers and sailors and flyers went down and died all over the world, from uh, the cities of Germany to the Alps and the Himalayas, the jungles of the Philippines, the forests and fields of Belgium, and the tiny islands of the Pacific. So these men were spread all over the world. At the end of the war, America was faced with a decision. What are we going to do about these guys? Now, I, I've had a chance to talk to some British folks here today, and what the British did was they buried all their overseas casualties overseas. So if you were to go to France right now, you would see alongside the American cemeteries, many, many British cemeteries and from World War I as well. So the Congress of the United States launched a program called the Return of the World War II Dead Program. And the intent of this program was to bring every man home whose family wanted, whose family wanted him home no matter where he was, no matter how long he had been deceased. Now, a question for everybody in the audience, how many other nations returned their dead from overseas? And there's no wrong answers, by the way. None is the correct answer. Well done. That's the first time somebody got that right off the bat. So that's good. That's great. Um, now, why did the other nations not bring their, their dead back? Not because they were bad people, but because most of the nations involved in World War II were far more damaged than the United States were. Yes, we had our, our many casualties, about a million casualties overall, 400,000 dead, 600,000 wounded. Um, but the other nations, besides having these, these dreadful losses, also had their cities destroyed. Many of them were, uh, they had political regimes that were overturned at the end of the war. And so those nations were in no position to do this kind of thing. Only the United States was. However, there was a bit of a problem with returning our dead, and I'll tell a couple stories about that. I am currently researching a C-46 cargo plane that crashed in Australia. Now, Australia is part of the British Commonwealth, and it's part of their uh, military procedure. Anyway, this plane had five Americans on it, and it had about seven or eight Australians on it. And all they were doing was flying from one town to another, I think it was an eight-hour flight. Well, for whatever reason, the plane didn't make it 
to the end of its flight and it was reported missing. And it turned out that it crashed in a little canyon right in the middle of a big cattle, uh, cattle farm. And somehow nobody saw it go down, somehow nobody ever came across it till about two years later. Now where the story becomes a little bit tricky is that um, of course all the men on board were, were killed and so they were taken to a, the local Australian cemetery to be buried, so as it should be. Now at the end of the war, Americans had the uh, option to be returned home. The British and their Australian, Canadian, New Zealand, South African friends did not. So, so um, a letter was sent from the Australian Embassy in Canberra to the uh, families back home of the Americans who'd been lost and they said, you know, we know that you probably want to have those, your sons and your husbands brought back home, but it's going to make an international incident here because the Australians, they're, the Australians that were on that plane, they're buried there too and they cannot be moved. So we have to tell you that this is going to be very problematic. So I'm still working this, this project, but all those Americans are still buried in Australia. And I'm very interested to find out what happened there. Now the other quick story I'll tell you is about five to 6,000 Americans were buried at Cambridge and Brookwood in the UK at the end of the war. And like everyone else, like the other uh, men that had died in the war, they had the option to be brought back home. Again, this was very close to causing an international incident because the British were not bringing theirs home. So, in my book, I've actually got a couple photos of this, but the way that America decided that they were going to bring these people home out of Brookwood and Cambridge is they were going to put them on trains at night so that nobody could see. And they were all shipped to Cardiff, Wales, and they were sent home from there. There were similar problems with the French and uh, with the Danish. They, uh, they felt that it was almost an insult to them to have these guys brought home. So a lot of problems there. All right. Next one. Anyway, these are some trains that are supposed to represent the British trains. These are actually American trains. I'll talk about a little later on. And one, one British um, statesman said this, then it kind of summed up the, the feelings of the British. He said, I shouldn't say the feelings of the British, he summed up his own opinion. He said, America feels that she is morally superior to Europe. American soil is God's own country and the rest unhallowed. So there was a lot of international anger almost that America was doing this. But Americans felt very differently. Americans felt that our government had an obligation to bring these folks home if that was the desire of the next of kin. All right, pardon the technical difficulty here. So one mother wrote an, a letter in and said, my son sacrificed his life to America's call and now you must as a duty of yours, bring my son back to me. And of course, we could take out the word son and make it brother or father or friend as well. In my book, that's gonna be coming out in 2016, I write a lot about a woman named Tessie Fast. Tessie Fast was a divorced mother of two living in Oklahoma City during World War II. She had two sons, like I just mentioned, they were named Guido and JB, and she lost both her sons during the war. So she wrote a letter after the war ended to President Truman. And this is what she wrote. And by the way, she was an, a very, very intelligent person. She, her file has got 30 letters in it. She went to Washington and met with Eleanor Roosevelt, just an amazing person. Anyway, she said, is this too much to ask considering they took all I had in the world my whole life's work. Would it be asking too much to have just one son's remains back that I might lay a few flowers on it to ease a small bit of the pain? 
Yes, I know the kind of arguments some people make about bringing the boys back. However, it is usually the people that say that are the people that the war has not touched. And let me tell you something. We mothers would rather have the truth than a lot of fancy falsehoods. They hurt a lot more. I'll talk a little more about Tetsi as we go on. And uh, one thing I like to talk about here also is, for people that are interested in this, the way that World War II changed how we bring our dead home. In the Korean War, they were brought home after about a week. Some were sent to Japan first. In Vietnam, brought home in a few days. And now, for those that are killed overseas, they try to, they try to bring them back to uh, Dover Air Force Base in Delaware within a couple days. So that's a real change, because if we go back to World War II and somebody was killed in 1950, 42, it might be 10 years before they were brought back. Now, the next question I'm going to ask is for the next of kin who had lost uh, folks overseas and who wanted them brought home, they had one overriding concern more than any other. And can anybody guess what that concern was? No wrong answers. They wanted to know what happened. Lots of letters like that. Yes. Another one. Yes. Exactly right. Thank you. Is it really my child? Because think about it. Um, many, of these, many of these men that died in World War II died in places with names completely unfamiliar to everybody back home. Now, yeah, you might know if you, if you heard, yeah, he was shot down over Berlin. Okay, I understand Berlin. But what about if he was shot down over somewhere over the North Sea or over Japan or over the Philippines? So, thank you. That's exactly the right answer. Now, on this topic, Tessie Fast was concerned as well. And I'll tell you a little more about her and why her story is so interesting. During the war, she remarried a man whose name was John Frost. So her name went from Tessie Fast to Tessie Frost. And the military was screwing up all the letters because the name was changed and it's really just watching her letters in the file saying, Get my name right is, is really amusing. Um, anyway, she wrote a letter to President Truman requesting to personally go and retrieve the remains of her son Guido. Well, we can all picture how that's probably not a good idea, not a safe or even appropriate idea. But she was not anybody that would take no for an answer. So she wrote letter after letter after letter going all the way up to the chain of command and she got back to President Truman again. And the letter that she wrote said, I suppose it will be denied, but I would like to go there when the body is exhumed. He had so many dreams of coming home, and he hated setting foot on foreign soil. He had no desire to travel away from the States ever. But as I said before, her request was denied. And, and by the way, he was killed on Guadalcanal. Her other son was J.B. J.B. was a flyer in the Air Corps, training in P-51s at a base in Florida. On July 31st, 1944, he and four other P-51s went on a mission, practice mission up to Valdosta, Georgia, and then back. And their, their outbound and their inbound were different routes. Anyway, that plane disappeared. And they think it went down probably over the Florida Everglades, but that plane was never found either. Anyway, in the end, she did have her son brought back, and she, uh, her son Guido was buried next to her in Oklahoma City. Now, I'll tell another story because this is an 8th Air Force story. John Hummer was a man from Morristown, New Jersey. He had three sons, and I've been fortunate enough to talk to two of them. His other son, his youngest son, was, was Bill Hummer. Bill Hummer was a navigator in the 44th Bomb Group. Any 44th Bomb Group today? Outstanding. B-24s. Great. Anyway, um, his son flew B-24s. And I'll see if I can find the picture of him here. Nope, that's Guido Fast. That is Tessie Fast's oldest son, Guido. Look at how young that guy is. I think he was about 19 there. He actually went to Oklahoma State for a couple months before the war started. So that's, that's Guido. Okay, so here is Bill Hummer, 
and his plane was K-Bar. Anyway, um, Bill Hummer was shot down and killed in Operation Varsity, which was March 1945, uh, assisting the uh, crossing of the Rhine River. And there were a lot of problems with Operation Varsity, one of them w being that for the B-24s involved to be uh, engaged in this, they had to fly very low because they were dropping supplies. Well, they flew low and they flew slow and the Germans knew they were coming. So it was a very, very bad day for a number of the B-24 groups that day, including the 44th. So after the war, John Hummer had that decision to make, do I want to bring my son home or not? And I think everybody in this room can think what an, ang what an anguishing decision to have to make because you bring him home and that presents its, it might bring you some peace and then again, it might not. So John Hummer wrote a letter to a general in the Air Corps and he said, following what I believe would be the wish of my son Bill, I don't want his remains disturbed, at least until such time you have communicated with me and I make a definitive decision. My son's death was the cause of his mother dying the following June, and there are other situations I must consider. And I might add that many of his letters are much, much angrier than this. He calls out every general in the Air Corps, and I, you can't blame him either, I guess. So, anticipating these kind of concerns, and by the way, his biggest concern was prove to me, government, that that's really going to be my son coming back. And uh, I'm going to go off topic here, or, or off my script a little, to say that I've read thousands of these files, and the U.S. government and the quartermaster and the military really, really did their job. The, the extent to which they went to identify these guys, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is absolutely incredible. So that's, whenever I read that, and you know, we all can say the government, government this, government that, but boy, they sure did a good job there. Now, the government knew that people were gonna be concerned, so they, they prepared a number of information circulars, one of them which was called, Tell Me About My Boy. Another was called Identification of Remains, and I'll just read a quick quote from that. In this, in this little five-page flyer, it said, No effort has been considered too great. Attention was given to even the smallest detail. And they went on to say that what we today call a chain of custody existed. In other words, none of these men would ever be anywhere where they were not in a cemetery where they were properly marked, all the way through the process. So the military wanted to let everybody know that yes, we correctly identified him. No, the remains haven't been lost. This is really what it's supposed to be. And the military had a very strict specification for the equipment that they used. And um, it's, all, it's all impressive. I'll tell one more Eighth Air Force story here. Nobody knows what a man named Ralph Shannon was doing on May 3rd, 1943. Ralph was the editor of the Washington, Iowa Journal. A very interesting guy and a very good writer. I've been able to find a lot of his columns and uh, the writings that he did all during the war and before the war, and he really sounds like an interesting guy. Anyway, nobody knows what he was doing that way, what he was doing that day. May 3rd was a Monday. Maybe he was just back to work after a nice spring weekend. Who knows? Meanwhile, 4,000 miles away, his son was the pilot of a B-24, nicknamed Hot Stuff. And maybe a few people have heard of Hot Stuff because one of the men that was on Hot Stuff was Lieutenant General Frank Andrews, who Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. is named after. And that's where Air Force One flies out of. So this, this flight and this event got a lot of attention for that. Anyway, Hot Stuff was coming back to the United States because they had finished 25 missions and they were going to go on a war bond tour all over the country. So all the guys on the plane were very excited. They were done with combat. They were going to be heroes and get to meet all the pinup girls and all that kind of stuff. So the uh, aircraft left England on May 3rd and 
unfortunately, in very, very bad weather, they uh, flew into a mountain in Iceland, very close to Meeks Field, which is where their base was. So, Ralph Shannon, father of Robert Shannon, had a decision to make after the war. And because he was a very well-known writer, he'd been around some, even though he was in this small town in Iowa, he was invited by the Rotarian Magazine, which was the magazine of the Rotary Club, to join in their November 1946 issue, which was called Bring the War Dead Home. It was about everybody's individuals, every individual decision that, were, that people were going to make about, do I bring my son home, do I not? So they invited Ralph to write a column. And um, his column begins with the question always asked, and that we've, we've kind of talked about today. He said, should we bring him home? Always there is a conflict in our thinking between our reason and our hearts. As we think of him, we continue to remember that he's there in that far off grave in Iceland. He wrote further in his article that we want his small nieces and nephews, Barbara, Mary Jo, and Johnny, to know the reality of his presence and learn of it as something that happened inside their world, not some far off in some far off war somewhere. So he closed his article and he said, speaking to the people that were reading the article, with you, reason may win. With us, it lost. Our hearts say, let's bring him home. And when that day arrives, we shall imagine happily, we hear again the words we heard so often in his lifetime. Thanks, Mom and Dad. So that's another quick story from the, from the, from the 8th Air Force. So in the end, we did bring them home if the next of kin wished it. And there was a, a very interesting government form that they sent out to everybody. And I didn't have a chance to make a slide of that. But it's really a, it's an unusual form for the government. Okay. Here's Robert Shannon. I think he was 26 years old. Actually, that would have made him an old man. Here is a photograph of the flag draped flag draped caskets of the crew of hot stuff in Iceland getting ready to be brought home. On October 27, 1947, so that's two years after the war ended, the headline of the New York Daily News announced, 400,000 people have gathered at Pier 3 in Brooklyn, New York to honor the nearly 12,000 men being brought home on a transport vessel called the Joseph E. Connolly. The article went on to say, in solemn and impressive conclusion, two Navy destroyers began dropping overboard more than 100 floral offerings. First to be dropped into the water was a large cross of roses, followed by a Star of David of carnations, an American flag of many different flowers. An army guard, an army honor guard was there to fire the 21-gun salute. By the way, this event was the, the event of October 1947. Life magazine, Time magazine, every newspaper in America, all the big periodicals devoted front page space to this. And this, a lot of my photos are from the Life magazine uh, article. A few weeks before that, another ship went into San Francisco Bay. That was called the Honda Knot, bringing back the dead from the Pacific Theater. Now, at that event, the governor of California, who was Earl Warren at the time, made a, made a speech. And he said, even in their returning, these, our heroic dead, continue to serve our country. Unlike the unknown soldier of World War I, they and their deeds are known. They will be born to the cities and towns where they lived, each a symbol of devotion and sacrifice. It's another photo of the Honda not coming in with the uh, Marine or with the Army MPs there. Another one of the speakers was Mark Clark. Anybody know who Mark Clark is? Yeah, commander of the Allied forces in Italy in World War II. Mark Clark spoke. 
More Clark spoke and said, the memories of the soldiers and sailors and civilians who died to give us peace and security must not be forgotten. The peace that they won must not be a mockery, which I think is a really good thing to say. The uh, large flowers there are from Harry Truman, the one that's a, a commander in chief on them. And my last quote on that will be this. Another general said, they gave all and they have left us their example. It remains for us with fitting ceremonies, tenderly with our flowers and our tears, to lay them to rest on the American soil for which they died. Over 13,000 people were involved in this project at a cost of $163.8 million in the 1940s. Now, can anybody guess what that is now? $14 billion. So give that, give that one some thought and think about the last time that perhaps the government spent $14 billion on, some, on something that we could all say is a good idea, right? I get emotional doing this. And part of the reason I, I, I guess I feel this way is that my dad's cousin, of course, was never brought home, never found. No one knows, really no one knows where the plane went down. Although there was a note in the file where someone said, B-17 tail number, 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 left us a message saying that they were about 20 miles off the coast of Scotland. However, I can't find any other reference to that. So, but, but in any case, it, it I guess I do feel so emotional about this because these were men that were found. Um, my book is going to come out in 2016, and anybody who's interested, you can pick up a flyer in the back of the room, you can sign the little sheet there, and um, pick up one of my business cards. In closing, I want to thank the 8th Air Force Historical Society for having me speak today, and I want to thank all you for listening. And mostly, I want to thank all the veterans and active servicemen in this room, service women in this room, for all their service to the country and to our world. Um, if you're a member of the 8th Air Force, would you put your hand up real quick? Let's all give them a big hand. Uh, what I'd like to do before I go is, if anybody does have any questions, I love doing a Q and A. Yes. My name is Nancy Hi, Nancy. Yes, we've talked. I think. Oh boy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He wore the uniform of this country. He gave his life, but he's not considered in the role of honor as the war dead. He's a DNB, died on battle. My plans is my to retire is to become that one person who goes and supports this effort. That if you wear the uniform of this country and you give your life, I don't care if you're driving a jeep or in a plane or on a practice drive, then. Yes. Thank you. And, and Nancy, you know what, I, I'd love to work with you on that. That's a great, a great project that you have in mind. And, and just to give one quick statistic, 15,000, that's 15000, American Air Corps flyers died in training crashes stateside. 15,000. What a number, right? And another five to 6,000 Marine and Navy flyers. Thank you. Other, other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, great question. About 75,000 American dead from World War II have never been recovered or identified. Now some of them, that's right, 75,000. Of course some of them will never be found because they went down at sea, they were in submarines or their, their aircraft went down over the water, but there are many uh, unidentified uh, Americans buried with, those, with that headstone that says unidentified Americans. And when I was doing this talk, 
uh, in Kansas uh, a couple months ago, I had a person come up to me who had an uncle that was on the USS Oklahoma, which was one of the battleships destroyed at Pearl Harbor. And he had just been requested to provide a DNA sample because they think it's possible that one of the unknowns from the Oklahoma is his uncle. So that's a great question. Another, another um, quick statistic is about 60% of Americans chose to have the remains brought back. 60-65%. The rest remain uh, buried in the overseas cemeteries of the American Battle Monuments Commission. Thank you for your question. Any, uh, any other questions or thoughts? Yes. I know her very well. I don't believe so. She, M Ruth Danielson, is actually my uh, uh, my business uh, developed person. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't think so. Is that someone you know or? From Vietnam. That's great. I'm glad they. F I'm glad they recovered him. Um, did you have? Yeah. Thank you. Any any other questions or thoughts that people want to share? I'm seeing. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Fantastic question. And I'll answer that story with a man named Ross Fuji. Ross Fujimoto. Ross Fujimoto was a second lieutenant in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the very well-known group of Japanese Americans that fought in World War II. He was killed in uh, southern France, I believe. And so his father, who did not speak English, he only spoke Japanese and lived in Hawaii, got a letter saying, we will now, we're now prepared to bring home the remains. What would you like us to do? So his father couldn't write, but his brother could. And his brother said, I talked to my dad. My dad wants Ross's remains brought back to the family burial ground on Honshu in Japan. And the government did it, all at no expense. Absolutely no expense. No expense spared. So what the form, you know, I'll have to put that form in my next talk, because you ask a great question. The form said you have four choices remain buried overseas, brought back to any private cemetery in the United States, doesn't matter where it is, we'll bring them back. Number three, brought back to any national cemetery in the United States, doesn't matter where. Or number four, any country in the world that we can get into. And because of the circumstances at the end of World War II, Japan was one that they could. So uh, they did bring them back to Japan. And the file is an incredible file because some of the parts were missing for the casket. And so they had to send a letter from Japan back to the States to get this all done, but it was all done in real apple pie order. So thanks for that question. Were there other questions back there? Other questions, comments? Stretch your arms? Yes. That's a great question. I like her idea. I think we should pursue that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, actually, there is, uh, a, now there's a National Historic Park, I'll have you in just one sec, uh, in San Francisco that is dedicated partly to Rosie the Riveter, to the Rosie, to the Rosies that did all that work in the factories. I, I think there ought to be more, but that's a good question. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no more questions, I'm going to say you have been a very, you've been a wonderful audience, and thank you for letting me kind of try out my Eighth Air Force talk here. Um, thank you very much. You've been great.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to preside over this candlelighting ceremony in honor and memory of those brave men and women of the 8th Air Force who flew the hostile skies of Europe during the dark days of World War II. Good evening to members and guests of our society. We thank you for your attendance at this reunion and for your involvement in this candlelighting ceremony. Our first candle will be lit by Dottie Smith, whose deceased husband served in the 493rd Bond Group, and this is Dottie's 31st reunion. signifies the reason we are gathered here. We are here to remember the, we are here to remember the history of the 8th Air Force. Let us now remember the fallen and those who survived, all of whom left an indelible mark on the illustrious history of the 8th Air Force during World War II. I will now call on our other candle lighters to illuminate this hall with candles of remembrance to all who contributed to the victory in Europe. In addition, let us also honor others who stood by them during their historic days. Lastly, we will recognize those of today's United States Air Force. Our second candle will be lit by Gold Star Sons. Ron and Dennis Rogers, whose father, Gerald Buck Rogers, was killed in action in April 1944. Nearly seven decades ago, 28,000 air crew members of the 8th Air Force sacrificed their lives for a noble endeavor. They're offering preserved freedom for our country and people for other nations. Let us now remember those heroes who now silently fly on one more peaceful mission. Our third candle will be lit by Will Davis, Prisoner of War, 392nd Bomb Group. This candle shines brightly for the 27,000 brave airmen who were once prisoners of war in a dark era of their lives. They survived the downing of their aircraft, only to be placed in a dismal enemy stalag. We salute those survivors for their perseverance and valor in the face of the enemy. Our fourth candle will be lit by Don Holmes, 458th Bomb Group. Don was a bombardier. This candle recognizes those who flew the bombers on new, numerous dangerous missions. These star airmen took off in Don's light, offered, often returning in evening darkness. Although facing a harsh environment, flak and fighters, they nonetheless were never returned or retreated from their mission. The fifth candle will be lit by Steve Hotoner of the 56th Fighter Group. We now recognize those daring fighter pilots of those that the bombers referred to as little friends. They flew to the defense of the bombers regardless of the danger facing them from enemy aircraft. Bomber crewmen watched as the little friends swept over them like a protective blanket until they reached friendly shores their gratitude was endless. Our sixth candle will be lit by Richard Shandor, 
board member of the Escape and Evasion Society. This candle gives recognition to the men and women of the 8th Air Force assigned to headquarters, wings, groups, squadrons, depots, and detachments. Their duties were essential to bomber and fighter operations and were of paramount importance in the 8th Air Force achieving its success and mission victory. Our seventh candle will be lit by Paul Bellamy and Jeff Hawley of the 1st Air Division Headquarters, Historical Society of the United Kingdom. This candle is in remembrance of our Royal Air Force Bomber and Fighter Commands. The stalwart airmen of the RAF fought gallantly before our arrival and then again by our side. They did so while continuously displaying an indomitable spirit, a spirit that will never be forgotten by their Yankee comrades. We also thank the British civilians who so kindly welcomed this friendly invasion of their shore. Many friendships were formed that will never be forgotten. Our eighth candle will be lit by Steve Snyder, whose father served in the 306th Bomb Group. We now recognize the men and women of today's 8th Air Force. They too are adding to the legacy of our Air Force history. Therefore, we salute this new generation of airmen and air women who are today protecting our nation at home and abroad during these trying but historic times. Our ninth candle will be lit by Damian Fisher and Olivia Coster. In closing, those who were there in World War II will never be forgotten. They pass on their saga to a new generation. Their words become the words of the next generation.